And it's time for a bike break. Today, we're gonna to talk about getting ready to roll. We're gonna learn about a variety of bike lanes and markings, and we're gonna see what's new in Bike Town. We'll also be taking your questions live. So if you're on Zoom, go ahead and use the chat function. If you're on Facebook Live, go ahead and put your comments in the comment section and our colleague Kareen will be handling those for us and making sure we're aware of those questions. Thanks for joining us today. Bike Break is brought to you by Smart Trips, the Community Cycling Center, Portland Bureau of Transportation, and it's made possible with support from Metro and the Federal Transportation Administration. And the event is part of Sunday Parkways Live, sponsored by Kaiser Permanente. And today's show is also brought to you by Flanders Crossing, putting bikes and pedestrians over cars since, well, today, since it's June 4th, and it's the opening of the Flanders Crossing. And I think we've got a commercial from our sponsor. There's a lot of screens here, so this commercial will be there soon. And it's worth the wait. Just like Flanders Crossing. If you haven't been down, I recommend. It's at Northwest Flanders, between 15th and 16th Avenues, right over the I-405. Thank you for joining us in that new amazing bridge. And excuse me, I have not introduced myself. I'm Timo with Portland Bureau of Transportation, and this is Matt. So I am the volunteer and event manager at the Community Cycling Center. And Matt, have you had a chance to go into Northwest Portland recently? I have not had the chance yet. I've got a reason why you should go down right now. Well, you can wait until tomorrow if you want. I Maybe the next day. I might go right after this, actually. <laughs> I say everyone should go down because to celebrate the opening of Flanders Crossing, brand new bike and pedestrian bridge, and the new Northwest Flanders Neighborhood Greenway, which is to say Flanders Street in Northwest between the river and the hills is now a neighborhood greenway. It's got low traffic. It's a low traffic street with diversion. It's got signals at the big streets. It's got all kinds of great stuff to make it a nice, uh, easy riding street in the middle of downtown. And to celebrate all that, we have a game called Go By Greenways. And you can get there, the information on it at gobygreenways.org. It's basically a scavenger hunt because we have placed little gem signs at eight locations throughout Northwest in locations that will help you find the new neighborhood greenway that we just opened, the bridge we just opened, and other neighborhood greenways that are being developed in Northwest. GoByGreenways.org has a map there, and so you can look at the map, and you can see right where the gems are. And the reason why you want to go and find them, well, one, it's a beautiful place to ride or walk. But if you go find one of the gems, there's a word on the sign. You text the word to the number on the sign, and you're entered for fabulous prizes. What would you think of a $500 gift card to Fred Meyer? I would really like that right now, actually. It, it, it could make a fabulous summer. Uh, you could also get a transportation wallet. Have you seen one of those? I have not actually seen one of those. Well, transportation wallet is a project of PBOT and uh, in this area, the Northwest Parking District, to encourage people, instead of getting that reserved parking place that they might have to pay for, 
to give up that parking place and instead get a transportation wallet, which has a $700 plus dollar value. It's got a full pass to the streetcar. It's got a TriMet pass. It's got credit for bike town. It's got credit for lift rides. It's like you just pull it out and you decide how you want to go someplace. So that's one of the grand prizes. There are several of those as grand prizes. There's two gift certificates to Fred Myers for $500 each, and there's prizes for local businesses in the area. So there's lots of cool stuff. And if you go find the gem sign, text the word to the number, you're entered. Every gem sign you find, you're entered again. And I'll give you a little secret hint here. If you take a selfie of yourself at the gem sign and text it, you might get an extra entry. So play Go by Greenways, gobygreenways.org. And uh, it's running from now through July 6th. So if that's not enough reason to get you out on your bike, let's talk about uh, how do you get re ready and set to roll? First thing is, let's talk about how's your bike. Uh, this is especially for those of you who've been leaving a bike off in a corner, in the garage. Matt, you might see a bike like that once in a while at the shop. What kind of issues do people maybe bring when they bring a bike out of the garage for the first time? Yeah, I think the thing I see the most is a lot of times they're really dusty and there may be spiders and bugs all over it. So I think before you even bring it into a shop, maybe if you want to wipe it down, get all the nasty things off it that have been on it in the garage for a while. But I think a couple of other things are, you know, people come into the shop, they'll drive their bike because it's not quite ready to ride yet. And a lot of times the wheels aren't on or the handlebars are twisted or the seat's pointing the wrong way. And a lot of times I think the most common thing is not having air in the tires. The tubes can hold air for a really long time, but over time they do lose the air. So if you haven't been riding for a couple of months, it's probably a good thing to pump them up or at least check the air before you take them for a spin. Well, it sounds like uh, some of those things might be obvious. Like if the saddle was on crosswise, maybe you want to get that straightened up. But things like the tires might be something that someone wouldn't notice automatically because if you haven't been riding for a while or if you haven't ridden regularly for a while, you may just not know what is it, what is a tire supposed to feel like? You know, what is a good inflation? There is a little handy uh, reminder for how to get your bike ready for every ride. It's called the ABC Quick Check. And uh, each of those stands for something. A is air, like in your tires. B is for your brakes, making sure they'll stop you. And C is for the chain. And we have a video from the CCC's Virtual Bike Club. And our uh, uh, often usual co-presenter, Madeline, is starring in that video. Uh, can we bring that video up right now? Hey everyone, now we're gonna do our ABCQ check. You'd wanna do this every time you ride just to make sure that your bike is safe and ready to roll. A stands for air. So the first thing we'll check is the air on our tires. I'm gonna do this by squeezing my tire here and make sure that it's nice and firm. If it feels squishy, then we probably want to put a little bit more air in it. If it's flat, then we probably want to fix the flat. Next thing I want to check is my brakes. I have a rear brake and I have a front brake on this bike. Does yours have two brakes or does it just have one? To check the front brake, I'm going to squeeze my left lever and try to roll my bike forward. If it doesn't roll forward, that means my brake is working really nicely. Next, I'm going to check my rear brake. I'm going to squeeze my right hand, my right brake lever and roll backwards. If my bike doesn't want to roll backwards, that means my right brake is working really nicely. Next thing to check is our seat, our chain. The chain lives right here. The way we check our chain is by pedaling backwards with our bike on the ground. If I pedal backwards and it feels really smooth and nice, that means that my chain's ready to go. If I pedal backwards and it's chunky or it doesn't want to pedal backwards, that means I might want to look into what is going on with my chain before I hop on my bike. Last but not least, very important, I want to check my quick releases, the cues in our ABC Q check. The quick release was right here and right here. These keep our wheels on tight. If our levers are open or loose, that means that our wheel might fall out while we're riding. So you want to check to make sure that your lever is closed and very tight. And then 
other than that, we just want to make sure that there's nothing that's probably checked that out before we run. Pause this and then how about we'll go ahead and put the link to that uh, presentation in the comments so that you can watch it yourself on your own time and use it as a reminder. And the uh, Community Cycling Center virtual bike club videos are a great way to get lots of information about uh, riding on the road, how to uh, get ready for a bike ride, and other things. So it's out on YouTube. Um, but the things that we missed because of our things that we missed because of our internet issue were to and Ellen did uh, and and the quick release lever looks like this. It's just a C. It's got that oh wow. So you want to make sure that it's nice and tight, that it's not wiggly, that it's not loose, and the wheel itself is not loose if you pick it up. Um, if it is loose, you can just use the other side to help tighten it on the other side. Do that on both sides. And then the last part of the check is my chips like it's rattling down, sometimes uh, bolts and things come loose. Any other parts that you notice when you're doing a quick check that to make sure that my fenders aren't rubbing anywhere? Because I feel like that is very annoying. Uh, there's nothing in between the tire and the fender. Do you uh, spin the wheel to hear if it's going to make a noise? Yeah, a lot of times it's a leaf, and that is annoying to me sometimes. Uh -huh. So I got to catch it before I start riding. Uh, I hear that. And when I hear that, I'm not, not happy either. <laughs> Um, and just make sure everything's okay. But what if things aren't okay when you find So the first thing Madeline talked about was air. And I come up with a little quick tune your bike up. I call it the five minute tune up to make sure that if you do the ABC quick check and something is off, then you can correct that quickly and move on. Uh, it's something you can do regularly, once a month maybe. Um, it doesn't take the place of a full tune up if you've been riding your bike for miles and miles and miles. And it's really, you know, starting to seem crunchy, but it will keep things moving pretty smoothly and save some money in the long run because components, well, what do components like? They, they tend to wear out. So when you don't clean your chain, the, ro the road dirt and grime and grease kind of become like little sandpapers on the gears in the chain. And eventually, if you don't clean it as often, you'll have to replace them more often. And that is money you probably don't want to spend if you can avoid it. Exactly so. Uh, so first thing to talk about was air. So generally, I always, uh, you know, as she said, you can give it a feel. Uh, I like to also use a, a tire pump with a gauge. And, and if you don't have one, just stop by your local bike shop, ask them, can I just check my tires with a, with a pump with a gauge? You'll see on the sidewall of the tire, a recommended inflation. And the, the, what kind of advice do you give to people about their inflation? I usually try to, I always stay within the recommended inflation. And if there's just a max, I usually go about like 10 PSI under. Um, it usually results in a more comfortable ride for me, but I think it kind of depends for each person. Different bikes have different tires. This bike has kind of medium sized tires. Some racing bikes have really skinny tires and they take a very high inflation. They might be like 120 pounds per square inch or PSI. And that's going to be really hard. And the idea is that the harder the tire is, the less resistance, because you're, you're making it have a really small, what we call a contact patch, where the rubber meets the road. It's a small amount, so small friction. Other bikes, like your cruiser bike, might have a big balloon tire, where it's really big and round. And that's designed because the more balloony it is, the more cushiony it is. So a racing bike is going to go fast, but it's going to feel really bumpy when you go over jittery pavement. Balloon tire bike is going to go slower, but it's going to feel cushy. And no matter what kind of bike you have, you can adjust 
inflation. As Matt says, don't go beyond the maximum. And oftentimes there'll be a minimum as well. Don't go below that. But try checking it somewhere, you know, towards the maximum maybe, give it a ride. If it seems too bumpy, let it out a little bit. So it's a little more cushy, it seems too slow, pump it up a little bit, but find your, your uh, comfortable inflation and then make sure that you pump it up to that inflation, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks, if you're riding a fair amount. Uh, so that's the A for the ABC quick check in our five minute tune up. The B is brakes. And so Madeline showed her bike checking out and the brakes work pretty well. But what would happen if your brakes were, oh, let me see if I can simulate this. Like if your brakes are moving, the brake lever is going so close to the handlebar. Let's see if you can see that brake lever if I stand behind it. The brake lever is here and as I pull it in, it's getting pretty close to the handlebar. In fact, almost touching it if I pull it really hard. What kind of, what, what is that telling me, Matt? It seems like your brake pads are a little bit further from the bike and you probably have a little bit of loose cable. Mm -hmm. So you want to do, if your bike has a barrel adjuster, you can turn it so the cable is a little bit tighter and not as slack. And oftentimes uh, on some bikes, the barrel adjuster might be up at the, the top, right by the brake lever, uh, especially on a mountain bike style lever. In fact, you can kind of see on this bike, it's got two right brake levers actually. This one and this one. And if I use this barrel adjuster, I'm not sure how much you can see in there, but there is a little barrel there that you can turn. Like Matt says, that will help tighten it up and that might do all that you need. If that doesn't work for you, that might be time to talk to your shop. Think about uh, new brake pads, maybe new cable. Um, but for your five minute tune up, you're just gonna try that barrel adjuster. Hopefully that works. Uh, the other thing you can do, especially in the winter time, is actually clean off the surface of your brake pads. Because like Matt said, grit, grind, friction, rubs down the wheels, not so great. If you have disc brakes, don't worry about that part. Or coaster brake, also don't worry about it. Then the last part, I'm going to have to adjust our camera, is the chain. And as Madeline pointed out, when she rolled her chain backwards, it sounded nice and smooth, but that might not be what happens when you roll your chain back. It might sound like crunch, crunch, crunch. So one thing you can do is get out your rag, my dirty rag. I have a clean rag that I use to wipe off the brakes because I don't want any grease on those. But the dirty rag is going to be okay getting greased. In fact, I'm just going to take it and rub my chain over it or roll my chain through it is what I really mean. Just to take off the surface dirt. I'm going to take my chain lube and this is a specific thing for chains. You want to get this from your bike shop. Don't use WD-40 or what else do people sometimes use? I saw somebody use Crisco one time. You know, <laughs> it could be a good emergency uh, uh, thing, but as a regular, on a regular basis, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but there are several kinds that are made specifically for bikes. And then I just find usually there's what's called a, uh, a magic link. I'm going to call it a magic link. It, it's just a different looking link. And that's, I'm just using it as a place to start and figure out, okay, I'm going to start dropping lube on there. And I'm just going to drop lube on every link of the chain. Maybe not even very carefully, just like drop, 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 work the chain all the way around until it gets back to that one link. So I can see every link of the chain has been oiled. I'm going to run it through like that. I might uh, skip my chain. And uh, basically just to work the oil into the chain. And then I'm just going to rub it off one more time with the rag. Basic idea. I want the oil in between the links, not on the outside, because on the outside, it's going to attract more of that red, dirt, sand. But on the inside is where the chain links are moving together, and that's where you want it to be nice and smooth. Um, if that still doesn't smooth things out, what other kinds of things might a chain be complaining about? 
I think sometimes too is just checking that your chain is on any of the rings. And what you could do is if you lift up your back wheel and you pedal forward, sometimes you just have it in a different gear than the chain should be on. And then once you spin it, it might just kind of fix itself. Uh-huh. I could hear that my chain fell onto a different gear than I was expecting when I did that little lubrication. Perfect, yeah, just like that. So when you're pedaling backwards, it kind of made a noise, but now once you pedal forwards, it goes to the gear it's supposed to be on, and hopefully that noise goes away. Um, occasionally, especially if the bike has been left out in the rain or something, you might see some stuck links. Um, Yes, there might be rust, and sometimes if you look at the chain that's not bending correctly and it's kind of like stuck in the spot, that may be time to go to the bike shop and pick up a new chain. So try using the oil first. Something might just be, you know, a little bit creaky because it's been sitting out too much. If the oil doesn't work, you know, ask your friendly local bike shop and see if they can recommend a new chain or something else to make that happier. Uh, so we've talked about how's the bike? Is it ready to roll? Let's say that the bike is ready to roll. Now, let's say you don't happen to have oil around your house, but you really want to get your chain oiled up. There's a couple of places you could go, uh, especially if you don't have it in your budget right now to get a new uh, tube of bike oil. They're not too expensive. They're like seven or eight bucks, but, you know, these are funny times. But there are folks who are doing free bike fixes. One of them is the Portland Community College Active Transportation Group. Right now, they're doing free bike fixes every Thursday at Cafe Zamora, which is uh, at uh, 3713 Southeast Gladstone. And we've got a link to their Instagram, and they usually do a uh, uh, post saying, oh, this week we're at such and such. Uh, for a while, they were at another location. It looks like they're going to be at Cafe Zamora for a while. But follow their Instagram, and you'll see. If you're in Southeast, that's a good option. Um, if you're in North, the Community Cycling Center, as a bike hub. Yes, we have a bike repair hub on the corner of North Trenton and North Wolsey, and it's open every Thursday and Sunday from 2 to 6 p.m. And if you come in a Sunday in July, there's a good chance I will be there helping out, so feel free to say hi. Um, yeah, all the fixes there are free, and it's a really fun place. We have a little skills park, too, if you want to try to ride your bike around some tight curves after you get everything fixed up. That's right. I forgot about the skills park. That's a very cool place to go and uh, practice or just have some fun doing a little uh, loopity loop. And there's also some great neighborhood greenways up in North Portland around there as well. Um, quick tip, if you don't know how to get to the bike hub at North Trenton and Wolsey, yes. you can go to portlandbikemap.com. And that is the electronic version of the TBOT citywide bike map. And it shows bike lanes in blue, low traffic streets in green, off street paths in purple, and so on. So you can see, how's, how can I find a nice comfortable route to get there? Um, you can also check out, uh, there's another nonprofit in town called Bikes for Humanity, PDX. And they uh, also do, uh, um, uh, free workshops, but right now they're taking a hiatus because of COVID. But they do have their curriculum for the class that they teach about bike maintenance online. And so you can check that out and see if you want to do a little homework here. Okay, so let's say your bike is taken care of. Um, how about the rider? How are you doing? Are you ready to ride? Well, I gave you one tip already. If you feel like you're not yet ready and expert to ride, Finding the least trafficy route possible to practice on is always the best idea. So again, portlandbikemap.com. And if you look for the purplish routes, that's an off street path, meaning just people walking, biking, maybe roller skating, but that's not gonna have any motor vehicles, except where you cross streets. But for general purposes, that's gonna be a very nice, easy place to ride. The next one is our neighborhood greenway network and low traffic streets, and those will be in green. And uh, those are great places to go because neighborhood greenways have speed bumps, they've got diversion, meaning places where cars can't go to keep going on the street so that that street is maintained as a low traffic street. Uh, and then bike lanes are, are pretty good too. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about bike lanes a little bit further. Um, but there's a few tips that are useful to know, especially if you haven't been out on the bike in a while, just to get ready to get on your bike. 
Um, what kinds of things do you tell kids when you're teaching them on, well, you're not doing bike camp, but I bet you know people who do bike camp at CCC. Yeah, I do. I might actually be helping out this summer there as well. So yeah. hopefully I'll witness this firsthand. I think one thing for kids and adults is tucking your shoelaces in. That's a really big one. I ride a fixed gear, and sometimes one time my shoelace got stuck in it and I just slowed down and fell over. So now I'm always sure that my right shoelace is always tucked in just so it doesn't go in the chain. You know, I had that same experience, but I was riding a tandem with my wife. Oh, no. <laughs> and we had a friend behind us who said that he thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. But you don't want to be that, that comic relief for someone else. What other kinds of things should folks be watching? Enough for. I think tucking in your pant legs. I think when you're riding a bike, the thing to think about is the chain and the chain rings are really sharp and they're moving. So anything around that vicinity, you want to make sure it's tight to your body or there's no chance of it getting stuck. So when you're wearing shorts, you're already taken care of. But my pants are a little floppy. I might do the very fashion forward tuck in. I might get a, a little strap to hold it in or I might just roll up my pant leg or I might just put on my shorts. <laughs> Um, one thing that's, uh, that I think is useful is to think about what's your ride going to be like? Are you, gonna, are you going out on a big, long day ride or are you just going to go around the, the street for a little bit? Uh, if you're just riding around the street, you know, it's always a good idea to have your helmet. And um, if you don't have a helmet, uh, legacy hospital trauma, trauma nurses talk stuff. Uh, I don't think we have the link for that available, but if you, if you do a a Google search for the legacy safety shop. They have uh, very plain Jane helmets, but they're at a low cost. And then you're also welcome to go to your local bike shop, like Community Cycling Center. I bet you guys have a supply of bike helmets for both. We have a really good selection and come on down. And I think the thing with helmets too is they're all meeting the same safety standards. So it's, you know, the more you pay, the sometimes the cooler they look or the lighter they may be, but everything should be just as safe as any other helmet. And uh, the CCC also has a great uh, virtual bike club on fitting your helmet to your head. So uh, take a look for that if you're not sure how to adjust your helmet. Um, notice I'm forgetting my script a little bit. So you'll just watch me look at my paperwork. Oh, nice. So as you're planning your trip, um, I recommend, especially since we're in summer, bring in your water bottle. Uh, you're going to get thirsty when you're biking. Not only are you exerting yourself, but you're moving through the air and the wind is going to evaporate moisture out of your body. So you want to be able to replace that. You might want to have a snack. And I recommend if you're not sure, if you're not feeling expert about stopping in the middle of the road, if you get a flat and fixing it, bring a TriMet fare. In Portland, we're pretty, pretty lucky that you're usually pretty close to TriMet and you can uh, all tournament vehicles have a bike rack. Hopefully there's a space for you uh, when you need it and uh, you can take your bike back home and, and get it fixed. Or bring a patch kit, uh, tire levers, uh, maybe a pump if you're getting really excited and, and, and committed. Uh, so for a longer ride, I'll, I'll bring those. For a short ride, I probably won't bother. Um, but a few things about how you're riding on the road, what, what, are, what are some of the tips that you like to help starter riders out with? I think one of the things when you're first starting to ride on the road is watching out for cars, both that are driving, but I think that comes kind of naturally. It's the cars that may be parked and oftentimes you're riding along them. That kind of takes a little bit for you to get used to because they're not usually moving. So you're not really thinking about them. And oftentimes people may be in those cars and opening doors. And once you've been doored once, you'll never forget it. And it's a lesson that you kind of take with you for the rest of your life. I like to tell folks to develop their spider sense, their spidey sense, or maybe it's their bikey sense. Because as you're riding along, uh, you start to pick up on what things are important to pay attention to. And just like you said, if I'm riding along a line of parked cars and I look through the rear window and see somebody in the driver's seat, that's telling me I'm gonna be extra careful because that person might suddenly open it up. Or if I see lights on a car suddenly come on, that might mean they're just about to pull out uh, or maybe they're just braking and about to stop. So uh, any kind of sense that there's movement on that parking side on your 
right hand usually, use extra caution. And as you said, you usually know that there's cars going by you on the left. One thing I like to do is first assume no one uses their turn signal. And secondly, if, there, if I am riding along and there's a car next to me or close by me, and we're coming up to an intersection, I watch their front tire. So if their front tire is starting to move, I know that they're probably getting ready to turn or they are turning. At that point, I'm either slowing way down, maybe I'm gonna turn with them instead of trying to go straight. Uh, so learning to pick up subtle clues like that is what will make it a lot easier to, uh, to feel confident and feel less likely that you'll have uh, an unexpected meetup with a driver and vehicle. Um, one thing I like to do if I'm going through an intersection, I'm going straight and I have the right of way, meaning I don't have a stop sign, I don't have a stoplight. If I see a car at that intersection or coming up to the intersection, I'm keeping an eye on the driver to make sure that I can see that they've seen me. And if I don't feel comfortable that they've seen me, I might start ringing my bell. I might start whistling really loudly. I might say, hey, how's it going? Just anything to get their attention. Because when people are pulling up to a stop sign, what I find is that they're often doing a quick look and then wanting to go. And that quick, quick look might pick up that you're there and it might not. But if they're looking and they're hearing somebody yelling, that's getting their attention. So intersection is often a place where you need to use a little more extra caution, maybe be a little more proactive about saying, here I am, thanks for watching. Um, and how about when you're on a bike path? Have you ever taken kids out on the bike path and there's other people out there maybe walking their dogs? Or... Yeah, we do our best to kind of give pedestrians the right of way and slowing down anytime you see anybody and making people know that you're there. There's been a lot of times where I've forgotten to ring my bell or to yell at somebody to alert them. And when you're buzzing by, it is really scary if you don't know a bike's coming by, especially if somebody has dogs. And I feel like a lot of people have picked up puppies recently. So you don't want to scare them and you kind of want to alert people as soon as you can. And like puppies, they might have young children walking with them. And we know that young children have lots of things they're paying attention to, but the bike that's coming along on the path is probably not one of them. So slowing down, giving room, and making them aware, that's all great ideas. Um, the other thing that I think is useful to note is that it's helpful to just ride predictably. So when you're riding, other people driving or riding or walking around you want to be able to sense what you're doing so that they can also interact. So specifically with cars. So for example, if I'm riding along uh, on a street that's pretty wide and there's a row of parked cars, but then there's like a space. I avoid the temptation to like pull over into that space so that I'm farther from the cars that might be passing me. I stay in my lane. I, in other words, I keep going straight so that the car behind me knows that I'm always gonna be in that space. If I move over, they might not expect it when I then have to come out again because there's another parked vehicle there. So basically riding, straightforward and also letting people know what you're going to do. For example, if you're going to take a turn one way or if you're going to take a turn the other way, or also if I'm stopping, I'll make this sign so that uh, I might be stopping because there's a pedestrian at the crosswalk and I want any cars who are behind me to know that they should also be stopping, but also that there might be another cyclist behind me and they need to know I'm stopping so they don't end up on my rear back, which would be uncomfortable. Uh, so, those are all some basics. Any situations that you have that have made you wonder, how should I be interacting with the road or other users? Feel free to put your questions in the chat, in the comments, and we'll see if we can answer them for you. Um, I think we're moving on now to our next segment, which is called, What's That on the Street? And this is to help folks who have not been out biking recently, or maybe even if you have been biking recently, maybe you have not seen some of the recent things that Peabody has been putting on the street. This is the way I describe it. When I lead bike rides, I tell folks, our transportation system has been developed over the last 100 years or so. Prior to 100 years, it was pretty much for everybody. If you had a mule, an ox cart, if you were walking, everybody used the street. 
But after around 100 years ago, cars became the dominant mode of transportation and all the roads were really designed for those. Well, after a while, we realized people still want to walk and bike and we need to redesign the roads. And as a result, we have different kinds of ways that we've done and they have evolved over time. So let's see the first slide. You're probably familiar with what I call the humble bike lane. It's just a plain bike lane. It's usually on a busier street, which can be great because it gets you to destinations, places where there are lots of businesses. It's probably going on one of the streets that goes straight to things. In other words, you know, a, a higher traffic street. And that's also partly what makes it a little bit more challenging, especially for new folks, because you have traffic on your left, which might be fast moving, parked cars on your right, which might also be moving. Uh, and uh, so, we show that in blue on our bike map. But then we've decided it's time to try to upgrade that. So let's go to the next slide and you'll see some bike lanes have gotten a little bit wider. We put a buffer in there and that is to give you a little bit more space from the traffic that's on your left. Uh, usually feels a little more comfortable the more space you have from a, a, a larger vehicle. Uh, in fact, some bike lanes have gotten even fancier. Let's see what the next development is. Oh, I forgot, in some places we have not only a buffer, but a very cool uh, marking to show you it's a bike lane and some of those markings get more creative. This was actually just a little Easter egg, a uh, secret inside baseball for Pivot. That was a superhero on a bike and on her cape, it has the letter T because our previous director was Leah Treat and she was a big supporter of safe infrastructure for people biking. Uh, and on our next screen, we see that uh, some lanes have even turned color. You might have ridden this if you've been downtown in the last oh, eight or 10 years. Uh, on Harvey Milk and on Oak, we have a, just a green painted lane. And so green has a special, it's a special part of the transportation language. It says this is a place for bikes. And you'll see that in a few different iterations. We don't have a lot of these right now. Green paint is kind of expensive. It's hard to keep up when car tires are driving over it day after day, but uh, we do use it in, in some places. Uh, in the next slide, we see a protected bike lane. And so in this case, we've actually put in a hard curb and some pylons so that you have a physical barrier between you and the moving traffic. And we do that in a, a couple of different ways. We use the pylons and curb, and let's see what we have on the next one. Uh, here we have parking protector. Oh, sorry, one moment. There we go. This is uh, not just pylons, but it's actually the parking has been moved out further towards the street so that those parked cars are actually protecting uh, the cyclists from folks who are driving even further to the left in this picture. Um, and uh, parking protected started very slowly in uh, one part of downtown, but now it's spread all over. So if you're in uh, riding along by Glendevere Golf Course in uh, uh, Northeast Portland, there's parking protected bike lanes along there. Um, there's parking protected lanes all over town. So one thing to be aware of is that people will be opening up their doors from the right side of the car if there's a passenger and they may be stepping out. So again, you're using your spidey or bikey sense to keep an eye on what's going on in that side of the thing. But usually you have a little buffer, so it's not, it's not uh, gonna be dangerous. It might just be surprising. On our next slide, there's a couple of other places where we use green paint. In this one, we know that folks on a bike may need to turn left sometimes, but it's kind of hard because legally a bike is supposed to be as close as practicable to the right curb. In other words, most people are familiar, slower traffic stays to the right, faster moving traffic on the left. So usually bikes are slower than cars, usually. Um, and so bikes are usually on the right-hand side of the road. But if you want to take a left, you have, you have a choice. You could, like a car, move into the center lane and then wait your time for the traffic to clear and then take your left turn. But for some folks that feels intimidating because you've got now two lanes of traffic going on either side of you. The left turn box lets you go straight into that green space and then turn your bike and that space is outside of the travel lane 
And when traffic is clear, and it's easy to see because you just look left and right, then you can move straight across to make that turn. When you're in the middle of the street taking a left turn like a car is doing it, you kind of have to turn your head all the way around to see if cars are coming. This way, you just have to turn a little bit to the left or right to see if cars are coming. So the bike left turn box is there to help make that feel safer for you. We also have right turn bike boxes in some places, for example, on Williams Avenue, where the bike lane is on the left side of the street, which removes a conflict with all the buses that are stopping for, um, for transit riders. And on the next slide, we have sort of a new thing. Here again, you can see the green paint, but just like on the Williams Avenue, we actually put the bike lane on the left to move away from the conflict with buses. Here we move the bus stop out a little bit so that folks waiting for the bus can wait on that little island and bikes can ride past. And there's a few of these happening now along uh, Southeast Division as TriMet puts in a new rapid bus line along there. The main thing to know about this, the green is saying, yes, this is a bike space, but on the other hand, you're between a sidewalk and an island where people might be waiting or want to get to, to get on the bus. So just be very aware when you get into this type of situation for pedestrians who might be either about to jump across the bike lane to go get on a bus or who might be coming off of a bus and in a hurry to get away from off of that side. I think that's all the slides we have in this uh, set. I'll bring you more later because we're going to talk about other kinds of uh, infrastructure on the street in our future um, bike breaks. Matt, have you seen anybody kind of confused by any sorts of bike infrastructure that we have out in the streets? Yeah, I live in North Portland and when the Rosa Parks protected bike lane first got in there, I saw a couple of cars that were a little confused about where to be, but I think as more and more people get used to it, people like know where to go and it's been getting a lot better I've noticed over the past year or so. Uh, you know, I noticed that too. I rode along Rosa Parks and I had heard complaints that people were putting their trash bins in the bike lane. But when I rode along there, people were very carefully putting them on the other side of the bike lane. So one of the things that we're confronted with in trying to engineer transportation for people biking and walking in an environment that had been very heavily engineered for people driving is that we have to do new things. We have to experiment sometimes to make them work. And it takes time for people to get used to those new designs. Um, but like you point out, one thing I've seen is that we put a new design out there. It can be a little, feel a little clunky for a while. I might hear people saying, why did you do this? It doesn't work. And then after you know, folks get used to it, they're like, okay, this is how I work with it. And it becomes second nature. Um, bike boxes are a similar thing. Uh, I didn't include a slide of bike boxes, but they are basically the green right up at the stop what we call the stop bar. So if you're going to a traffic signal, in other words, you're gonna to have to stop at a red light. Normally, if you're driving in a car, you pull up to the crosswalk and you stop there. Well, with a bike box, that white line that you stop at is pulled back a little bit and the part near the crosswalk is filled in green and bikes are encouraged to get ahead of that stop bar, the place where cars stop, and to fill in that box. And sometimes people just line up in the bike lane and make a big long line. The idea is, Everybody pulls into the bike box and fills it up so that when the light turns green, all those bikes can just move forward and keep going. And then cars in the lane behind them that want to turn will know, okay, all the bikes have cleared out when they see that it's empty and they can make their turn. Whereas if everybody's stuck in the bike lane, the car's waiting and maybe isn't seeing the bikes there. So that's why the bike box is designed that way. And again, that green is telling you that's a place for bikes. So we'll see more of that soon. Then we're moving on to, we talked about how to get your bike ready, how to be ready, what you'll find out on the streets, but what if you don't have a bike, but you wanna try getting out right now, or maybe you've got a bike, but you wanna try a bike that's got a little bit more. What do you recommend people? I think Bike Town is probably the best way to go about this. You read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> bike Town is Portland's bike sharing system. And let's see what Bike Town has to say about its new bike. This is the new Bike Town e bike. It can be unlocked by scanning the QR code on the back. 
and it features a cable lock that once unlocked should be moved into the riding position. The seat is also fully adjustable. On the handlebars are brakes, right for rear, left for front. The electric assist meter can be found here. Moving the dial will increase or decrease the amount of electric assist given. This all comes from the battery. The bike also features a low step through for easy mounting. Full fenders for all weather. And a sleek basket with a bungee cord to carry your belongings. Bike Town, you may have seen it around. Uh, you may have seen them around for the past few years because Bike Town has been around since, oh, I'm going to say five or six years. But the old Bike Town bikes did not have what the new Bike Town bikes have. They were basically very sturdy, very durable, and very heavy. And you were putting all the energy into pedaling those bikes to get them going. And if you were on the flats, that was great because they're a nice, stable bike. But if you were on a hill, that was a little challenging. The new Bike Town e-bike, as the advertisement said, has an electric assist. So it's not like a motorcycle. You don't just turn a handle and suddenly you're going fast. It's when you pedal, your pedal power is being enhanced by the, um, by the motor. And the adjuster thing there basically decides whether to give you a little bit of extra boost or a lot of extra boost. So in other words, if you're riding along on the flat street, you might choose to have just a little bit of extra boost so that you're keeping up with traffic. But if you're about to get to a hill, you might turn it up to more boost so that you can get up that hill without breaking a sweat. Uh, so this is great for folks who maybe want to commute to work and need to show up not looking sweaty. And that e-assist really helps keep you from having to be the engine that's getting all overheated. Uh, it helps for folks who haven't been doing a lot of exercise but still wanna feel the, the, the joy of riding a bike and maybe they've got hills around and they don't wanna have to feel like they've gotta walk their bike up the hill. Um, and also it's just fun because you go a little faster than you might normally. But please use that power wisely. I think we have a few slides to, uh, to show. So other new things about Bike Town, the service area has expanded. So the service area is where you will find bikes and where you can park bikes. You could ride a bike outside of the service area and park it, but that would get you a big fee. So you wanna make sure you're within the service area. And the new news is that there's gonna be another expansion coming. So we'll have even more places where you can ride and park your bike. The other uh, thing to know is that within most of the service area, um, you want to park at a bike town station or rack that's marked bike town. You can park other places, but you'll pay a dollar fee if you park not at a bike town rack. Unless you're one of the lucky people who has a destination east of 72nd Avenue, because there you can park to whatever, uh, whatever fixed object, usually a bike rack or a pole or something like that. You can park to that and you don't get that extra dollar fee. So. Little bonus for those of us who live east of 72nd. Uh, what do we have next on there? Bike Town has a new minimum age. You used to have to be 18. Now, high school kids, get your helmet. You can be 16 years old and you can ride a Bike Town. Uh, we also have a bigger fleet. I think originally Bike Town fleet was about 1,000. And when we got the electric bikes, we bumped it up to 1,500 last year. This year, we're poised to get to 2,500 bikes. So that means more bikes around where you are so you can find a bike faster and uh, have, have a bike more easily accessible. And there are new ways to check out the bike. So there's the phone app, which as the commercial showed, you use your phone camera and it scans the little code on the back. If you happen to be a Someone who uses Lyft and has a Lyft app, well, now if you open up the Lyft app, it won't just say where there are drivers nearby, it'll show you where there are bikes nearby and you can choose to ride your bike instead of have somebody pick you up in a car. And you can also request to get an actual Bike Town card 
that when you wave it over the reader, it will unlock the bike for you. Um, all this comes with, uh, next slide, a new price structure. So you can get a membership, $99 a year, and that lets you just ride for 10 cents a minute. Uh, maybe you don't wanna make a commitment yet, that's fine. Every time you do a ride, it'll just be a dollar fee to unlock the bike and then 20 cents a minute. So if you've got a 10 minute ride, that would be $2 for the per minute charge and a dollar, so three bucks to go uh, 10 minutes, which on an e-bike, you can easily do 15 to 20 miles an hour. You can get a lot of destinations in that, uh, that small, uh, for that small fee. Uh, and then we also do have a special program called Bike Town for All. So if you have uh, qualified for the low income rate, you get an even better deal. So um, the, do I have one more slide on this? Yes. We have a program called Adaptive Bike Town for folks for whom a normal or more usual bike, I should say, it does not meet their needs. And so we have things like this recumbent trike where you can sit down, sit back and you pedal forward. So we have a variety of adaptive bikes. This is just one of them. This one is, comes also with an e-assist and several of the others come with e-assist as well. We also have things like side-by-side uh, -side tandems. So you could have a, a friend with you. Uh, we have hand cycle bikes. So uh, if pedaling with your hands is more, uh, more useful for you, you can check out one of those. And the adaptive bikes are found at the Kerr Bikes uh, Center, which is right near OMSI. So it's on the east side of the Willamette River, right along the East Bank Esplanade. Uh, I think the address is water, just about two blocks south of the Hawthorne Bridge. Um, just go to biketownpdx.com. Had to ask, <laughs> um, and that will get you all the information there. And uh, we'll see more expansion of that. The idea is that you might have a bike, but maybe you've got a bike that you don't want to ride into town and then have to park on the street and worry about it while you're working all day. Bike town might be a great way to get there. Uh, or maybe you are going to meet up with friends and somebody's dropping you off there, but then you want to be able to ride home. And maybe the bus is not running that late. Bike Town could be there for you as well. So there's a lot of ways where Bike Town can fill in, whether you've got a bike, whether you don't have a bike. All right, what have we not covered today? I think we've, we've, we've talked your ear off. Do we have any questions in our chat that we have not uh, handled? All right, well, like I said, feel free to uh, put them in the chat or on the Facebook page, even after we're done, and we'll check those and, and get back to you with any questions that you have. Uh, so really appreciate you tuning in today. Um, just remember to play Go Bike Greenways at gobikegreenways.org for fabulous prizes. And when you're in the neighborhood, go check out Community Cycling Center. See ya. We are on 17th and Alberta and we're open every day from 10 to 6 p.m. Um, Woohoo! That's great. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.